Hi folks, it's Darcy from ThePurposefulPantry.com and today we're doing the cutest little maraschino cherries in the cutest little dehydrator that's ever been made. Uh, we're going to be working with um, maraschino cherries, learning how to dehydrate those, as well as working with my new dehydrator, the Snackmaster Junior from Nesco. So stay tuned. Okay, are you ready to dehydrate some maraschino cherries? We get this question a lot, so I wanted to go ahead and do one so that you could see how it works. Uh, it works exactly the same way that cherries do, except you don't have to do the prep work of pitting, uh, and it is it does have more sugar in it, so you're gonna want to go ahead and make sure that you have rinsed um, all of these cherries before you use it. You can save that liquid if you want to make syrup, but make sure you rinse it. I've already done all the rinsing already because you didn't need to see me rinse, but we're gonna go ahead and do these in a dehydrator. Now, we're only doing this in this new Nesco because I wanted to play with the new Nesco. This is not a sponsored post. Uh, they did not send this to me. I purchased this with my money. Uh, it is a very small, compact uh, Nesco Snapmaster Junior. It's the FD41B, uh, and it is 400 watts. It is very small. I mean, you can see my hand size. It is very, very small. Um, and it would be perfect for people who are in RVs or campers or trailers or have tiny apartments, cabins, tiny houses. This would be perfect for my dad's tiny house because it's small enough that he could actually stick this up on top of the cabinets and it doesn't take up a, a tremendous amount of his storage space on his uh, countertop if he wanted to dry something. Now, as with all machines that are 400 watts, you have to remember that drying times will be different. When you get a range of drying time in a book or in a tutorial or my website, it's generally for the machines that are in the mid-range, like the, the 500 to 600 watts. Uh, so just know that things may take a little longer in this machine. Um, so I'm going to give you, because I've already used it uh, a number of times, um, I'm going to give you some pros and cons for it, okay? The pros for this, I'm, well, let me load some trays while I'm doing it too. Well, let me show you this. I'm just gonna jump right to this. Okay, so here is the tray. It is This is a plastic case, uh, but the stainless steel trays. This is how large they are, or how small they are, however you would like to look at that. Uh, they are made for small quantities because it's a small machine for small spaces. Um, they are stainless steel trays um, that um, cannot be soaked. You don't wanna soak these, uh, nor do you wanna soak the little, um, like it has a drip tray on the inside that can be removed. Um, the compact size is great. The temperature here uh, is 95 to 175, which is typically different than you don't get quite that high in most machines. Or in 95 is getting hard to come by in the analog machines, but 95 on the low end is pretty normal for most machines. Okay, one drawback I had about this is that when you're putting your trays into the slots, those runners here are not quite wide enough, and I kept finding myself tipping a tray easily, okay, just like that. And you can lose stuff pretty easily that way. So you're just gonna have to be a little careful about how you put it in. They could have made those just a little bit wider uh, or made the tray a little bit wider to make that easier. But I know they were trying to give some uh, ease of putting this into your machine. Okay, so what it does not come with is any kind of liner. So there's no mesh sheets that come with this, nor um, are there fruit leather sheets. This really, it, it, it's, it's the price of this is $47. So that's why they keep it, uh, additional things aren't added. But what you can do is just use some um, strips of parchment, which is what I'm gonna be using today. And no, they're not pretty. I just tore them because I'm not gonna use them again. So strips of parchment that you can just place on a tray like this to do, or you can use uh, any of the mesh or the Teflon sheets that you can get on Amazon. They're third party. Uh, they usually are less than $20 for either set, some just around $16. Uh, dollars now um, that you can cut to fit this if that's an interest to you. Um, so, and I'll leave links down below for the ones that I use that I've used before on my Kasori that I've used on my Excalibur so that you can know that those are the ones that I've always used. But this, this is, this is how it works easily. Okay. Another con to this is that you may not be used to it, but when you want to turn the machine off, you have to actually hold this button for about three seconds. It's not just an on off. Turning it on is immediate, but turning it off, you have to hold it. Um, and at first I kept thinking, why isn't it turning off when I try to turn it off? But you know, of course I hadn't read the manual yet. Um, but that's how that works to make sure. Um, and when this is, it, this gets really hot, okay? In a small space, it's really, really hot. Uh, 
Um, so when you're touching these trays, if you've been running at 170, you're going to want to use something or just give it some time to cool off before you pull a tray out. The other thing about it is that the fan will still run on this until the internal temperature drops down to about 115 um, because it wants to cool that machine down instead of trapping the heat on the inside. So uh, know that that may, when you turn it off, it, the fan may still run for a little while, just so that you know. Okay, let's get loading some of these cherries because that's what we're here for. Not for the machine, but for the cherries. Now, what you can do is go ahead. Can you see that? Let me lower, let me adjust this down just a little bit, sorry. You can choose to just load these just like they are. They're whole, they've been pitted, so there's there's the, the area where the pit came through. Uh, some of these may be even broken more, but what you might find to get a, a faster, better dry on this is to go ahead and cut them in half, okay? Because, like I said, one of the drawbacks for this, this is not the best knife for this job, uh, one of the drawbacks for this machine is that uh, it's a lower wattage, so it takes longer to dry. And these cherries will take longer to dry as well. But because they're not fresh, they've been canned, uh, and well, you know, in a jar, um, they, they may take less time than a fresh cherry to go through because they've already been sort of processed. So we're going to go ahead and do this. It's also not a great surface to be cutting these on. But I'm going to go ahead and get a bunch of these cut for you and just go straight ahead so that you don't have to watch me struggle and uh, get these ready to dry. Okay, let's go ahead and get one of these ready to dry. But I know that many people don't have access to fresh cherries all year. Uh, they usually only come in the spring, early summer. Um, and so this might be an option for you if you're trying to find something to put in your oatmeal, if you're trying to do something for breads or fruitcake, if you want to try that. Um, any, and you know, it's just for fun, if nothing else, because you can do all sorts of things in your dehydrator. So I'm gonna cut up a few more of these. And then we're gonna load the trays. And so I did go ahead and choose to use parchment paper because of the sugar content. Uh, I don't think that these are gonna stick all that much to the tray, but I wanna make sure that I don't have to worry about that at the end. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use some parchment. If you're using things that aren't quite so sticky, um, I wouldn't do beef jerky just on, on the tray. I wouldn't do um, any kind of fruit on the tray. Um, I might do vegetables on it. Uh, those holes here are small enough that you're not gonna have a lot of fall through. You know, do marshmallows on it without worry. Um, but anything that's gonna get soft and then kind of fold into the this, I would use some kind of liner on your trays. So let me get a few more of these done and you don't need to watch me cut all this uh, or prep it all, but let me get the rest of these done and we'll get the tray filled and ready to go. You know, while I'm cutting this, um, I'm thinking, you know, a little bit ahead about, um, you know, some of the other pros and cons for this to make sure I think about how I process. We did kale uh, the first two times and they worked, it worked really great. I mean, it was, there wasn't a problem with it at all. They, they it dried relatively quickly. It was just fine. Um, but I kept thinking that when I first saw this, I was going through Amazon and looking at, I'm sorry that you're not seeing anything happening. You're just seeing dead space. But I was looking through the Advan, a, Amazon list of dehydrators because I always kind of try to see if there are new ones and I haven't done that in a while. Uh, I try to keep up on what's being newly released um, just in case there's something that comes out that seems interesting to people. Uh, and when I saw this, I went, oh, it is so cute. Um, just because, you know, I am as practical as I am uh, with just about anything that I do. Uh, I can be swayed by some cuteness. All right, let's load up the second tray. I'm going to use that knife to hold it down because my my parchment is kind of it's towards the end of the roll, so it's really bendy. Um, okay, so when you're using parchment, people always ask, is it going to cut down on the drying time? Or is it going to make the drying time worse because you're affecting the airflow? All machines, uh, at least all good machines, are engineered to have some kind of barrier because they're made for fruit leather. Uh, if you're making fruit leather, you have to have a solid tray. So what you can do, I wouldn't do it with these because the moisture, even though I've rinsed them, there's still quite a bit of, uh, of the syrupy moisture in here in the water. Um, what I would not do is um, go through, for this particular thing, but any other project that wasn't kind of weepy, that could be, I, you could go through 
and just punch some holes. I'll do it on this one because it's just going to fall into the tray below it. You can actually slice or punch some holes in that parchment if it makes you feel better about the airflow. Um, but because this machine is running from back to front, it's going to go across that. It's not going to affect the airflow. And even on stackables, they have the center hole uh, that helps circulate the air. They have usually have uh, holes on the edges, uh, but they're engineered to have that kind of flow. And while it does come up through the trays, the main part of it will dry even if you've got a, any kind of parchment or fruit leather sheet or anything on there. So let me get this one done. All right, now for real, I'm gonna go ahead and just cut the rest of these, get the trays loaded, and then I'll come back to you when I'm done. Something else I forgot to mention, when you're doing fruits like this, when you're cutting it in half, it's always best to load your trays with the cut side up because you wanna give every opportunity for all of that moisture to go away. So if you have a solid sheet down here, and if you put them down with the cut side down, you're kind of trapping a little moisture, which will just make this take a little longer. It's not gonna stop the process, but having them cut side up, best way to go. All right, so here we go with that tray back. Okay, so for this last tray, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a whole cherry. Uh, I'm not gonna cut them down because I wanna see, want you to see the difference between how they are uh, whole versus cut. I just always do cut because it just goes so much faster. I needed to get a towel to wipe my hands uh, and I didn't want to get a white towel. So uh, when I do cherries, I almost always cut them because we use them in stuff. We don't use them to eat on their own. And even in smaller pieces, I'm, I would much rather have a faster drying time than I would a whole cherry because I'm not doing the cherries to make it look good. I'm doing the cherries to store, to eat, uh, and to get it done fast. I don't want to have to wait around for a whole cherry. So to start this thing, let me get you settled again so you can see how this works. Sorry about that noise. Okay, this is right here. Oh, I'm going to do it right here. This is the standard look that it gives when you turn it on. So we're going to get it started. We're going to crank that temperature up. At this point, I am not trying to save the vitamin A and vitamin C of these. Um, I'm going to go ahead and crank this time up. It only goes up to 24 hours. I know that tomorrow I will have to reset it. Um, and these dials go all the way around. It will start on its own if you've left it for 10 seconds. Um, but because the, I'm not trying to say the vitamin A or the vitamin C in here that goes depletes the higher up you go because in their canning process to get them ready for serving, I mean, get them ready to sell, they have already lost that which I would try to save. So I'm going to go ahead and dry them a little higher to get them to dry a little faster. Sorry, I'm still trying to get this to stay. All right, it's not going to. So um, this will take, like I said, anywhere from 18 to 36 plus hours depending on your machine depending on how you cut your cherries, depending on the humidity in your home, depending on how tightly you pack them on your trays, all those things are gonna affect the drying time of your cherries. So let's get going on the dry time. I'll be back with you when these are done. Okay, 20 hours later. One, two, three. Power off doesn't just power off. You have to actually hold it down for three seconds. Okay, so even though it's not running, that fan will stay going, according to the manual, until the internal temperature of this thing has dropped below 115F. So, which is, what, 35? No, that's 95, is 35. 42C, I think that is. So, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and open the door. Now, when you're dehydrating anything, this is not the moment to test your food. Because what happens with most foods, uh, that's hot, is that when it's in the dryer, this is going to be warm and sticky because the heat makes sugars expand, makes everything soft, so it's not a good time to test this. However, the test piece that I took out uh, a couple of hours ago was perfect because it was allowed to dry, I mean allowed to cool off, uh, and you want to give it about 10 minutes, maybe 15, depending on your weather, all that kind of stuff. You want to give it time. These are the whole maraschino cherries. I did not cut these at all. They will be a little more pliable than your have ones, just because there's more surface, and there's you know the bigger gap on the inside for it to squish into and stuff. So you want to give that time. So you can still hear this running, even though I'm not. It's not actually running, but the fan is running because it's trying to cool this thing off. Which is one thing about this machine that I've never seen in another machine before. There may be other dehydrators that do that, but this is the first time I've seen it, um, and I'm sure it's to help cool off because the plastic. This is not. Um, it can hold on so much heat it probably does it just to save all the components okay so I'm just gonna go ahead and turn this off so you don't have to listen to it okay so here are our pieces this is what they look like 
totally dry. You might still see some, like the, it's all shiny, but that is from sugar, it's not from moisture. Um, we're gonna give this a few minutes to dry. I meant, sorry, to warm up. I meant, to cool off. Good grief, Darcy. Um, we're gonna give it some time to cool off so that we can test it then, but even holding it in my hands already, when I'm shaking them together, I'm starting to hear more of a hollow sound and clicky as they get as they get cooler. So, um, I don't know if you can hear that. But the goal is, The goal is a really good test to tell if your fruit is dry or even your vegetables, especially if you're trying to get something really dry for storage, is when you drop them on the countertop, you're not going to want to hear that kind of plunk. You're going to want to hear, oh, somebody sneaked the sample that I had out. Somebody was sneaky. Um, what you're going to want to hear instead is more of a plink. See, you hear it that way. You're starting to hear it. I don't know if you can pick it up on the camera, but when we first dropped these, there was more of a thud, and now we get a, no, that one, okay. So you need to give them time to, to cool off. So we're gonna give them some time. I'm gonna go just pull because the trays are so small. I can do this and get them out of that heat. Shut this down. Leave that door cracked open just a bit. We're gonna move these here, and we're gonna give this just a couple minutes, and we will come back and test. In the meantime, Get your jar ready that you're going to put it into for conditioning. Um, I've already marked the top with the date and the item. Okay, we've got all of this plenty of time. It is time to start double checking this. Now, you can hear, can you hear the difference in what I had earlier? There you go. We have more plink than we do plunk. That is the sign of well dried fruit if you're going to store it. Okay, now the texture. To me, the texture is just like a dried cherry. It's not, granted, it's not gonna be that soft, chewy stuff that you get when you buy dehydrated fruit from the store because they've added either a lot of sugar or some other chemicals to keep it soft. That's not what this is, but it is dried. Immediately putting this into some hot water, some hot milk and oatmeal, um, you know, putting it into hot water to simmer to get it ready for putting into a bread or anything, that will work just fine with this, okay? You know what a gummy candy tastes like? That's what this tastes like by the time you get, it softens up in your mouth and you start to chew it. It doesn't have the same consistency as a dried cherry, but it has more of a consistency of a gummy candy. I hope that helps you know the difference between the textures between the two. Because it was cooked first, because it was canned. All right, I'm gonna make a mess. Cause that's what I should have called my channel, the messy pantry. And again, the sticking here is not because they're not dry. You might even see that they're really shiny. That's the sugar. Now that we're finished there, here's conditioning, okay? They are in a jar that's a little bit bigger than what their volume is. And you're going to put it in a jar and you're going to shake it. And you're going to put it down and you're going to come back tomorrow and you're going to shake it. And you're going to come back the next day and you're going to shake it. What you're looking for is any of this sticking together in a large clump that when you turn it over and bits stick at the top and you shake it and they don't come right off. If you turn it over and you see large clumps sticking together and they don't easily break up, you need to start over. Put them back in the dehydrator, let them dry some more. You keep doing this every day for about five days. You know, you can do it longer if you feel like you need to. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for any sign of this stuff clumping up and sticking. Now there's gotta be some compaction sticking because this is sugar. Um, and when it sits there for a long time and all the pressure coming down here, oh, sorry, and all the pressure pushing down, uh, it may start making things stick on the bottom. So that when you turn it over, you're gonna have some things sticking on top. If you can easily shake it off and it comes off, then you're fine. That's the compaction sticking. It's not because it's wet or it's because of any issues, okay? What you're looking for is those clumps that won't come apart, sticking that won't easily shake off. 
uh, or any signs of what you see is moisture buildup on either the fruit or on the side of a jar. All right, so if you're just gonna snack on these and you know you're gonna snack on these and they're gonna be gone in a week or so, don't bother conditioning. It's fine if you don't do that. What this is for is to protect you in your long-term storage. Putting on the shelf and coming back two months later and seeing it full of mold because there were some pieces that really weren't dry yet, that's what you're trying to save yourself from with conditioning. Okay, so there you go. Now, if I wanted to vacuum seal this, you could. If you were gonna put this away for long-term storage and you wanted to put an O2 absorber in here, you could. You don't need to though. And I know a lot of people get wrapped up in that. It's not necessary. What's necessary is fully dried fruit and vegetables that have been fully dried, conditioned, and stored properly. That is all you need. For things like powders, I tend to use a moisture absorber on those powders that I'm in and out of all the time and that are prone to sticking and clumping like fruit powders and some vegetable powders, not a lot of them, but some of them. I use a moisture absorber in those. And uh, because I'm in and out of that jar and it introduces moisture into that jar every time you open it. That's when you should use a moisture absorber. Or if, uh, but if you live in a high humid state, or country, wherever you live that has a high humidity, you're gonna to wanna to add moisture absorbers to those jars that you get in and out of. Now putting one in a jar that stores on the shelf that you put it away for a few months, you don't need it because you're not in and out. You're not reintroducing moisture. The minute you open it and use it, um, and, and if you're getting in and out, that's when it's recommended because it stops moisture buildup in jars that you get in and out of. I, I can't, how many times did we say in and out just then? I don't know. Maybe you could do a drinking game for how many times I say in and out. Okay, so that's when you need those extra additions to your jar. But you don't need super, you don't need to go buy a vacuum sealer. You don't need to go buy food, jar, you know, the food saver jar attachments. You don't need to go buy a bunch of extra stuff for this um, because it's not necessary. As long as you follow proper drying and storage, you're fine. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use them, and it can give some people a feeling of extra assurance that their food is safe, that their food is not going to spoil in the cabinet, um, but as long as it's airtight with what you've got in it, you've got time. Okay, you're fine. So, that is a maraschino cherry dried, and then our lovely, lovely, cute little Nesco uh, Snapmaster Junior dehydrator. But I just thought you guys would love to see this uh, just to see how it works, especially for those that are in small spaces in an RV or a trailer or a tiny house like where my dad lives. This would be perfect. All right. And until I see you next time, click right here on a video on all about storing dehydrated foods. And until I see you next, again next time, happy dehydrating.